Um, well, you're here to learn about some sensory strategies, but you can't learn about strategies unless you understand the why you're doing it. If you work with, are there any OTs? Any OTs? Do we say that? O SLPs? We didn't I know say it, but no. No OTs, SLPs. Okay. Any administrators? Great. Welcome. Guidance counselors or psychologists? Welcome. Great. Just want to see who our audience really is. Um, if you've worked with an occupational therapist, they tell you to do a lot of goofy things sometimes, and it sounds really odd. So the more you understand the why, you're going to go, oh, that's why she wanted me to do that. For instance, I wanted a teacher one time, I said, can you please give him a, um, I, I'm pretty sure I used the word, heavy work job as he walks down the hallway, because he's all over the place, and he's very scattered, and his hands are on other students, and he has a really great deal of trouble uh, with self-regulation. Um, and I asked her later, how did it work? And she said, it didn't work. I gave him a piece of paper, but it didn't seem to do any good. He held it in one hand and had his hands on other kids at that. I went, oh, no, 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 no. So you know where I'm going with this. I meant a heavy work job. I wanted both hands occupied. It. I wanted 5% of his body weight. I wanted good stuff going into his nervous system. And he also had something that he was focused on, a transition object from A to B of where he was headed. So um, either I didn't explain it well enough, or maybe she just had a moment where she didn't get it all. So at any rate. So we're going to talk about a lot of things sensory-wise. I always will go with universal design. So I want to think about whether my kiddos have a learning disability, they're neurotypically wired, there's sensory processing disorder, there's attention deficit, there's some form of an ASD. Whatever the problem is, and just those great, like I said, neurotypically developing students that all need to practice self-regulation skills and know what works for them. So think about these kids first. So we're going to go more towards universal design. And what I know is that all student, students can benefit from these things. I'm going to ask my kids, I want them to understand, what do I need? What helps me be a good student? And most of our kids can, can tell you that. Some of them aren't old enough to understand what that means and know it all the time, but they start to make some connections pretty early. For those of you who sat in the back with all due respect, you might be someone who says, I just like my space, I'm fine back here, I pay attention really well. Someone in the front might say, I need to be front row and center to get all my attention and my focus. I find I'm a really good listener, but when I'm in the back, I lose the process a little bit more. I don't feel as engaged for my learning, but we're all different. So we need to think about how we are different as learners and then how our students are also unique and different. I know that all kids need options with seating. I have one teacher who does a great flexible seating options in her entire classroom. All kids should have access to know what kind of lighting and visual stimuli are good for them, what is too much, what is too little. Looking at noises, movement within the classroom, time to be able to wake up, versus time when I need to calm my body down. And the more our kids learn what works for them, the more they are going to be able to self-advocate and be able to make the appropriate choices as we teach them in little snippets. And then looking at what's calming strategies I'm using and what kind of writing tools my kids. If you were with us um, earlier, we talked a lot about behavior as a huge trigger uh, with writing involved. Whenever there is work demand made, there's a frequently a behavioral response for many of our students, and it's frequently all about the writing component in some specific area for that child. So we want to offer different tools. And then I want to also look at, for universal design, I want to think about having big muscle, functional, purposeful movement. I want alerting, organizing, and calming activities built within the day. And I, I know you all probably have those, I start, used to say one student, but you probably have 10 students that you're specifically thinking about that have sensory needs or behaviors that look like they could be sensory oriented. And so think about those students, that you, those really high need kids you have, but also think about how if you are a special ed teacher going into support a gen ed classroom, how you could ask and have integrated activities for everybody and not just for one or two kiddos that you're going in to see. So think about yourself, how are you when you are going to a workshop? What do you need to wake yourself up versus calm yourself down? This morning you probably started out all great. We had breakfast and hopefully good sleep. And you went and heard Paula Cluth, who just makes you laugh and fall off your chair, and has wonderful tips, so you're all fired up. But then all of a sudden you had a great session, but then you get lunch and we start to get a little sleepy, a little tired. And so what do you need to do to self-regulate? So if anybody needs to stand up and go in the back of the room and do jumping jacks, I am okay with it. Just stand to stretch, whatever you need. So we find things that work for us whether it's going to talk to a friend when we're upset, um, when we're frustrated, anxiety, anxious, removing ourselves from a group, things that wake us up, like taking a fast walk, doing something brisk, movement, 
a piece of mint, a uh, piece of chewing gum, things that just alert us and orient us more to being more present and in the learning mode. So lots of things that we do automatically. You'll hear um, occupational therapists, a lot of times we would talk about a sensory diet. Has anybody heard that term? Okay. And when I like the, a newer term that's being coined is a sensory lifestyle. And so it looks across the whole entire day. What's that going to look like for our kids or for us? Because we do sensory things all day for ourselves. We just don't think about it, right? And so the sensory lifestyle is more from the time I get up until the time I go to bed. What kind of sensory supports did I put in place to make me be at my very optimal? That homeostasis when I feel awesome and amazing and I could do anything. I, I mean, I would like to like bottle that moment because I have it more in the mornings and I can tell when it is and I can see as it starts to go downhill and how I have to get it back and how can I do that. So we have our hills and our valleys. I like the plate there still as the idea of that diet because we're going to talk about a plate full of food. I've got my big, my big meal there. It's going to have big pieces of good sensory and we'll talk about this in a bit. That's going to fill me up for an hour and a half to two hours that's going to stay in my nervous system. So you're going to we're talk about structured movement, heavy work activity, deep pressure touch. Those things are my big sensory meals. My little snacks are going to be my little things, like if I lower the light, we'll all calm down or we'll all fall asleep. If I give you a peppermint, mm, I'm all alert and I can feel pretty good, I'm with you for another 10 minutes. Peppermint's gone, might go downhill again. Light a candle, wonderful aromatherapy, candle's gone. So those are the little snacks, if you think about them therapeutically, but more so that the big bang is going to be when I get that big exercise, that big push in using my muscles. And I'll explain that more, but I want you to have an idea where we're going. So each of us need a certain amount of uh, sensory input to be sensory regulated throughout the day. A normal state of arousal is necessary to support all of my impulse control. I can't have good self-emotional sensory or social regulation if I'm not well sensory regulated. I have to be able to have, let me get out of the way, I can tell you're trying to see on that side. Um, being able, a normal state of arousal for tolerance, for attention to task, and my balance and in my emotional reactions. <laughs> Think about that if you're pretty sensory regulated and somebody comes along and walks behind you and steps on the back of your heel, it really hurts. And you kind of, wasn't very unexpected. And I might turn around really quick. But if I'm pretty sensory regulated as an adult anyway, I might have gone, ouch, and someone's apologizing and I'm okay with that. But now be seven or eight and that happens and I'm really dysregulated and I'm probably going to turn around and punch somebody unfortunately. So we have to have sensory regulation, all of us do, to do what we need to do. And when we don't, we have exactly those things. I'm going to have poor impulse control. I'm going to have poor attention. I'm going to have poor focus. I'm going to have a real difficulty controlling my emotions. Um, all of these things, it's just language, memory, and emotional centers are all involved when we do something. And it's all in our interpretation process. And so if I smell something that, oh, I smell cookies, I might have a memory right away. My mom made cookies when I was little. I love the oatmeal raisin cookies that she would make. It smells, it gives me a good feeling. And uh, we'll talk later about the, our sense of smell it goes to our limbic system. It's very emotional. That's my memory of that sensory experience, right? When I was a kid and I went to the dentist and I would get a filling, the drills back then were very loud and noisy and you could smell the sulfur. That memory, that sensory experience is still my sensory experience. Even though years later, I know all of that isn't the same. But someone says, oh, you're going to need a tooth filled, that's where my emotional center goes to, of that little bit of anxiety of being a little upset. And so think about that with our students, that we might not think this is a big deal, this shouldn't be a problem, you're making it, you know, this will be just fine. And many of our kids have sensory memories that was their experience of what they feel, what they still carry with them. This is just to let you know that there are tons and tons of sensory systems. Touch, vestibular, proprioception, visual, auditory, olfactory, gustatory, and interoceptors. And so we're going to talk briefly about that. Now, we remember we have an hour and 15 minutes. So we're going to try to hit on as many strategies as we can. And I'll keep the, you know, the, the in-depth talking about sensory to a limited amount. I like this slide because I put it where my teachers can see, where they make their copies. I used it in our other lessons as well. It fits right here. Sensory is the foundation down here at the bottom of the pyramid. All the way to the top is academic learning. How I process sensory information impacts everything else in my being, to be social, to be uh, 
a great student, have good memory skills, to be able to coordinate, hold my head and, up, head and neck up against gravity, to be able to write and read, to be able to control my impulses. All of these things are based on how I integrate sensory information and how good of a sensory processor I am. So I want you to keep that in mind. This goes all the way up to affecting language, visual, spatial, attention, daily living, behavior, bilateral skills, all of those things. So that's why it's important that what, I know you have only 20 minutes to do whatever you need to do, but if you can take just a small bit to make sure that we've got our kids sensory regulated, you're gonna get more bang for your buck. And they're gonna be happier students. Okay, this is just a quick idea. It's described, Jean Ayers was the forefront of starting at talking about sensory integration. She was an occupational therapist who laid all the foundation. And she talked about it being like a traffic jam on the highway, that all this sensory information, you just heard all these different senses. And we take in all this information from our outer senses and our inner senses. And then the, our brain is supposed to interpret it and make some kind of an adaptive response appropriately to the environment. And for many of our students, it's really, really hard. We know now that um, part of sensory is part of the evaluation for autism. And many, many individuals on the autism spectrum as adults will say the most impacting thing about their autism is their sensory processing difficulties and challenges, not the other areas that you might have thought. And so it's, it's impacting our children who don't have the ability to say what they want to say. Yeah, I wanted to say something about this. Sensory processing disorder. Cheryl's going to flesh that out a little bit in a minute. But I wanted to say we as teachers very rarely will get a student with an official diagnosis of sensory processing disorder. Has anybody ever had a student with that official diagnosis? Just a few. But I can guarantee you that every one of us in this room have had kids with sensory sensitivities that impact their learning. They may not have the official diagnosis, but sensory is a big deal in the learning of many of our kids. Think about, think about your classroom. Think about the student who is always tuned out. Looks like behavior, but they may have an auditory processing difficulty. Think about your student that writes all over his paper. He may actually have visual processing challenges. Think of your kid who chews on his pencil all the time. You know that kid? He may be sensory seeking in several ways. Think of the kid who is always in trouble in the cafeteria every time. He may actually have sensitivity in his olfactory system, in his sense of smell. That one's actually my favorite. I hope we get to that one because it's my favorite one. But these sensory sensitivities, overactive, underactive, seeking, craving, avoiding, they affect the way our students learn. So as she's talking about sensory processing disorder, think about the students you actually have and how they may be showing signs that this is an area that's affecting their learning. Yeah, and this is just again letting you know about how it impacts everything in our lives, as well as there's an estimated about 5 to 15 percent of the population affected. Approximately 8 in 10 individuals with autism are deemed to have sensory needs of some. And this more list, we, we guys get the idea of how it's impacting everything. This is just quickly, I just want you to realize that if you're working with occupational therapists or someone who specializes in sensory, that it's not just one term, it's not just one problem area, that there are very many sub areas of sensory processing disorder. And you'll hear us talk a lot about sensory modulation. And that's that just right amount of everything that homeostasis. I can self-control, I have the ability to self-regulate myself, I feel alert, I feel awake, I feel in my happy place, the best that I can be. And, that, and when our kids get out of balance, we can see what happens with that. And then it goes into sensory discrimination and sensory-based motor disorders. But for today and for our time, just want you to be aware of that. Okay, so we have our kids that have the over, under, and sensory seeking. So you'll see mixes of that with children that you'll see kids that are over-responsive for auditory, but they may be under-responsive for where their body is in space, okay? We may see kids who are sensory seeking one area, but under-responsive. We may see children whose kind of patterns change, um, and sometimes we see it throughout the day, but we will see a combination of sensory that it's just not a clear picture. Um, so we can't just say, oh, he's all this or he's all that. He may be that Venn diagram of a little bit of this and a little bit of that. We're going to be talking a lot about kids who are over-responsive, kids who are under-responsive and who are sensory-seeking. 
My down and dirty definition of these is the kids that are over responsive, I see as my drama queens. The ones that really, really react badly when somebody accidentally bumps into them in the hall. Often, they're over responsive to one of their sensory systems. Under responsive, I see these kids who are so often tuned out in the classroom who are the last ones always to hear the instruction to line up at the door. <coughs> Lots of times these kids are under responsive, especially to auditory stimuli. And the sensory seeking kids are often the kids with ADHD. It looks like ADHD. It isn't always. Sometimes it's just sensory seeking, sensory cry craving, wanting that heavy duty sensory input. So all of these can be in a mix in our students. And before we treat their reactions as behavior to have consequences, we need to try to set them up for success by recognizing what they may need to feed their sensory system. Okay. And it looks very behaviorish sometimes, right? I always say when we do sensory, you know, it's not someone's not in a wheelchair. They don't have a cast on their leg or crutches, and it just looks very behaviorish. And if you think about your own self from a sensory perspective, you're thinking, well, it's not that loud in here. It was a really quiet room. But when you have a kiddo who has such hypersensitivity to auditory that they can hear the lunch cart down the hall across the other side of the building, or the tiny sound of the Duquesne humming that sounds like it's magnified to their ears. Um, but, it, but we can't see it, so it's hard to get yourself there. I literally, this is so, you know, just a side note, I had a uh, vow the other day and the mom told me that this kiddo who was very sensory seeking um, was eating. She had to hide the package of the raw hamburger in the grocery cart because he would take his finger and dig his finger in the hole and eat the raw hamburger. So I, about the time I think I've heard I've heard it all. No, we have not. We have not. <laughs> not in this world, right? So this again, just I don't want to spend too much time on this. is just the sub areas. It's on your slide showing that what a motor area is and those motor challenges, those are impacted from sensory. That sensory discrimination to peace. You have the ability to probably reach inside your desk, grab out something that you need, whether you, oh, it feels like my scissors, feels like, like my pencil. I think that's my shiny folder I need without even looking. You have a good sense of tactile discrimination. Many of our kids don't. And so then we wonder why they're the last kid who can ever get anything put away or put a paper in a folder, put it away and inside their desk. Um, tactile discrimination is just one example of that area of disorder, but it gives you an idea. Um, and then again, being able that modulation piece of just being able to tune out what's not important and tune in to what is important. And you know, just as an example, is I might be talking to someone and so engrossed, and it was a really loud. We were at a reception last night, really loud, lots of people talking, and I was able to just tune in to the person I was talking to. And so all of a sudden, somebody I heard my name said, and then well, it's like, what are they saying about me? You know, right? <laughs> so I'm kind of like tuning in. So that, that my modulation kind of got shifted just a little bit there. So I had to bring myself back. But again, many of our students don't have that ability to do that. Okay. And so the first area we're going to talk about is our tactile system. Okay. If you think back to that sensory pyramid that Cheryl, Cheryl showed a few slides ago, at the very base was the central nervous system. Right above that, as the core of our needs, were three sensory systems, tactile, vestibular, and proprioceptive. You know, when we think of senses, we tend to go back, I tend to go back to the senses I learned in like fourth grade, you know, seeing, hearing, smelling, touching, and tasting. Okay, those are still very important and impact our kids' learning. But as teachers, if we can address those three big dogs, give kids regulation tools, for tactile, vestibular, and proprioceptive, we're going to have a better chance of impacting their learning. Let me get out of your way over here. So, tactile. We know that kids with autism can either be hypersensitive or hyposensitive to touch. That's no surprise to anybody in this room. Our neurotypically developing kids can be hypo or hypersensitive to touch too. Uh, why is that important? It affects both behavior and academics. Let's look at how a kid with hypersensitivity to touch may be affected in his behavior in a classroom. A student who's hypersensitive to touch may show meltdowns at these times of the day or the year. Season change, community circle, group activities, writing tests. Can you think of what might trigger 
a touch sensitive kid to have a meltdown during that time? Can I use you as an example? Yeah. I'm standing in line right now. I'm touching her. Sorry, thank you. If she's hypersensitive to touch right then, that's going to set off her fight or flight and she may deck me, she may yell, she may have some sort of a meltdown just because she's hypersensitive to touch. So, sensitivity to touch can significantly impact behavior in a classroom. Be aware of that. Also, touch sensitivity can significantly impact academics. Go figure. Look at these things right here. Learning difficulties. A hovering, may I invade your personal space? A hovering teacher may shut down her learning. Okay, I'm sort of touching her arm right now, but it doesn't matter. I'm in her personal space. If she's touch sensitive, she's going to be more worried about me being there than what she's supposed to be doing. Okay. You guys are free. I may And you can you tell those kid the, you can tell those kiddos who are because they're the ones that kind of I'll go into observe and they're kind of leaning back or they're over the side and yeah. Yeah, and then you can tell the ones that just kind of cuddle in. They just want some more of that good cuddle part. Yeah. It, it's it's just amazing to watch group activities. Our Indiana State standards say we have to include a ton of group activities in our education. But the kids who are touch sensitive may shut down during that. <laughs> for obvious reasons. You have this kid over here who leans across this kid here to make a comment to this kid over here. This kid's getting touched. And if he is a touch sensitive kid, over responsive to touch, his learning has shut down. You can pretty much guarantee that. So anyway, other areas that touch sensitivity or over responsiveness to touch can impact academics. So what does it look like in a classroom? We already talked about sensitive to human touch, sensitive to skin. When we change seasons in an elementary classroom and kids go from shorts to long pants or from short sleeve or tank tops to jackets, kids who have overreaction or oversensitivity to touch may have behavior issues. Sometimes we just have to be detectives to figure out why this student is melting down today when he was okay yesterday. Touch sensitivity may be one of those things. There are some other things that we might see in a classroom that indicate a student might be over responsive to touch. Kids who have trouble in PE sometimes it's because they're over responsive, thus fearful, of the ball touching them or other kids running into it. Again, it's just one of the clues to put in your detective bag when you figure out what's triggering a behavior in your classroom. Here are some other things to watch for. These are all on the handouts on the um, flash drive. So if you don't get it right now, it'll all be there. So that's nice to know, but what do I do about it as a teacher? One of the things you can do is when you have a young student and you need to hold their hand for safety or in the hall, and you think this student might be over responsive to tactile stimuli, rather than grabbing his hand, which we as teachers tend to do sometimes, put your hand down and usually, not always, but usually the child will go ahead and take your hand. And you respond with the same amount of pressure that they give you. If they squeeze, go ahead and give them a squeeze back as you walk. If they just sort of do the fish hand into your hand, Give them that kind of response back. There's a good chance their hand will stay there, but you're being responsive to their need in their tactile system. Don't hover over kids. Give them space. Be aware of that. Allow flexibility in movement. Lots of times kids who have over-responsiveness to touch have a hard time sitting in the same chair for the whole day. We're going to talk more about that in some other categories too. But these kids may need to change their seating option through the day in order to keep their learning vibrant and active and on point. Um, talk, to your, talk to your OT. OTs now are really <laughs> working to do the sensory regulation activities in the classroom rather than down the hall. That's part of that universal design for learning. We want to keep kids in the classroom and what's going to work for this child with touch sensitivity is probably going to help a lot of the kids in the class. So talk to your OT. They're going to have wonderful ideas on how you can integrate this into your classroom. 
allow exercise breaks. We're going to talk more about that in a little way. It is a wonderful way to help kids regulate their sensory systems, including this area of touch. And then looking at, you know, exposing our students to the opportunity to have activities. If they're really hyper over responsive, I don't want to force someone to stick their hand in a pumpkin to get out the seeds. I'm going to allow them to be able to say, we can use plastic gloves, we can use a scooper. Maybe we put out one seed and we kind of, you know, give it a little touch. There's ways that we can keep embedding opportunities for tactile play. I don't want them never to have the chance to grow, but I also want to respect that this does not feel good to their sensory system. And then trying to look at respect for personal space. We sometimes have, we just really want our kids to come over and join the group. And many of our kids, particularly those on the spectrum, sometimes need just time to look at the big picture. What's really happening here? What's going to be happening here? Do I feel safe? And whether it's being too close in personal space tactilely, maybe it's auditorily, maybe it was smells, whatever it is, allow that respect. It's okay. And I have so many times I think our kids that look like they're not listening, they are listening and they're picking it all up, that they've just decided to remove <coughs> themselves. So we need to give that, a, a, that there's a reason for the, their behavior. Yes. And so it's looking at, and you know, um, all, per, all professionals, t you as teachers are unique. You're going to go to any professional that has their own unique, their, their standards, their educational pieces. What we're really saying here is that if I have a student who is that tactfully defensive that this pencil feels horrid in his hand, I want him to love to write, right? So I'm going to try to figure out to treat the whole child. I don't really like the word treatment. I'm a school-based therapist. I want to provide supports for that child and figure out how can I help him to be less tactically defensive so that he'll want to write, whether it's a keyboard, whether it's a pencil. Um, and many times we go in for light pressure. We're all very gentle souls. And when we do light pressure touch, we frequently put ourselves on fight, flight, fright. We put us on our sympathetic nervous system when we go in to touch someone if they are tactically defensive particularly. And so if I come in with my soft little pencil grip, grip and going to hold my fingers over his and show him how to do it, I might just set him over the edge. That does not feel good to his nervous system. He is ready to just scream and run. Deep pressure touch is calming to our nervous system as we talk about um, strategies in the next couple slides. It will make sense. So I would say it's not that I'm not going to try some different kinds of pencil grips and maybe something tactically will feel good. And it doesn't mean I'm not going to try to figure out how we can help him with his writing. But I'm going to have respect for his tactile sensitivities. Okay? So I've got to work on that. Does that make sense? No. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, how we would all feel if we all had to use the same thing and do the same. You know, if I, even when I introduce a pencil grip and half the time kids have started bad habits very, very, very young. I asked a student just the other day, if you could just try this one time a day, during spelling words. You don't think about anything else but printing one word at a time, and that's it. See if you like it. If you don't, it's okay. We'll try something else. Okay? So it's not there. And I'm also going to, you know, just a side note, get your kiddos in a vertical position. As soon as I get them in that vertical position with the writing marker, chalk, whatever, I'm activating the little intrinsic muscles intended as I bring my wrist back in that vertical position. So that will help his positioning for skill building on that side of the hand. Okay? Um, so yes, so trying to find out how I can respect loose fitting clothing. Lots of our kids don't want things that are too, um, too tight. Other kids are seeking deep pressure touch and they want really tight, tight clothes. We had a student one time that the only sign that they saw at school was his jeans were incredibly tight. I mean, he could barely get them zipped. He was a really slender little guy. But that at home, his mom would then start to give us more examples. He was seeking deep pressure touch because it calms his nervous system, even though he had some tackle defensive tendencies. The deep pressure was helping him. So the loose fitting clothing, clothing that's been washed tons of times, don't put, you know, Temple Grandin, who's a famous individual on the autism spectrum, will talk about don't, you know, all the crinolines and the dresses that had to be washed before she could wear anything. I can't even imagine putting a crinoline, crinoline on anyway. Um, and then providing tactile strategies is something to have, to hold, to get used to, of whether it's a fidget, whether it's a fuzzy, whether it's something that feels good tactilely to that child. And then when we look at big sensory supports for, and I'm talking about really intense sensory kiddos. These are the kiddos that I might say I might need to do I want to teach the kiddo themselves some slow rolling, that if I have a sensory area that when they log roll, they're getting deep pressure touch to their system. If I give them a weighted blanket, I'm providing the weight, weighted deep pressure touch. But many of our students love that. It might be a lap pad with 5% of body weight in it. We had a student who said she could only do her homework 
when her big giant cat sat on her lap and she could pet him and it was warm, it was heavy, it was awesome. And so that would be that same kind of input and feeling. And so those kinds of things are really great tools, but again, I want to try to start before I need a tool, what can I teach the student to do? I mean, we've taught our kindergartners how to give themselves squeezies. If you're familiar with the website, it's S-C-O-O-L, School Moves. If you keep going into her blog, she has a really nice sheet that is, I can calm myself. And one of them is squeezies. And the students literally, we just slowly count deep pressure all the way down our arms and deep breathe between arms. And what I'm doing is I'm giving myself deep pressure touch. Think about when you swaddle a baby, they stop crying, right? Typically unless they're hungry. Because now they know where their little bodies are in space, you've given them deep pressure touch that calming, it puts me on parasympathetic nervous system. And that's what we want for our kids. So how can I have that receiving blanket feeling over here in school? And that's the challenge sometimes, but it's not that hard to do. I'll show you a few other ones. But trying to look at whether I need a weighted blanket, if I need a weighted lap pad, a pressure vest, if I decide I need to do a sensory brushing program with a, a kiddo, I want, as an OT, I want to be on that plan. Um, I had a teacher the other day who said that she had a weighted vest down in her room and she was thinking she'd try it on so-and-so. Uh, you know, you can buy them online. You don't need an OT's okay. But I said, you know, in school anyway, I, I would like to come in. I want to make sure it fits them properly. I want to make sure I put it on right. I want to give you a wearing schedule that we can work with together. And then let's monitor, did it make a difference for this student? And what else are we putting in place? Because if I'm going to put weighted things on a child, a weighted vest or a pressure vest, there's going to be some pretty intense sensory needs. And have I, what else have I tried in addition to that? And remember, we're working with the whole child. Um, the beanbag chairs there, because beanbag chairs, when you wedge them against the wall and you've got actual good stuff inside those beanbag chairs, that's like that blanket. I can get deep pressure as I get their bottom in that chair and bring that around them. It's a, like a big hug. It provides calming and organization and where is my body in space now? It's like that receiving blanket. So we might offer a variety of seating options, beanbag chairs, the yoga cha or ball chairs, yoga mats, anything that we can use and find things that work for our students and ask them. I don't think we talk to our kids enough. Did you like this or you like this? How did you feel when you were on this? And did you like sitting on the floor better? Did you want to be removed? Did you feel better when you had your big lap pad on? How was that? It might have been, as uh, Paula showed this morning, the double big giant snake that was weighted for two students, which is great too. And then the next area we're going to talk about, um, and I just want to say under that tactile area, remember you're also going to have those kids that are under responsive and seeking. And they're looking, that, you know, it's the kiddo who never notices foods all over his face. He needs to go look in the mirror. He's, uh, you know, he, he wants more and more and more, the messier the better, because his sensory system is seeking and needs more to register. Ah, here I am. This feels good now. So there's a reason why they are doing the behavior but we're going to have to work with the whole child. The next area is vestibular processing. And our vestibular system has an impact on everything. Um, it's the receptors are in the inner ear. It affects our gravitational security. I'm trying to look at coordinating my eyes and hands working together, visual, spatial, my head and body position. And my vestibular system actually maintains my muscle tone. And uh, the fluid has activated the fluid in my inner ear with stopping and starting and movement. So this enables me to think about it. When we have our kids and you see those children that have their head resting on their hand, their elbow is on their desk, their head is on their desk. Maybe they didn't get good sleep the night before, but when you start to see patterns of that, and you'll see the kiddo whose hand is in his lap and he's doing everything with one hand, even though he clearly does not have a broken arm, and you start to look at different patterns with kids, and you can see this is frequently children who have vestibular processing problems. It has an effect on me being able to print and to write. There is a very strong relationship between our different systems. And it's really kind of cool that also with our, vi our vestibular system and our language center, there's a great connection. So when I'm up and I am moving, I'm going to have more ideas, more thoughts, more um, language come spontaneously as well. Okay. And when you think about vestibular, think about I've got to hold my head and my neck up against gravity. I've got to be able to control both sides of my body. I've got to get my eyes and hands to work for writing or reading. I've got to do all of these things. And if I have a faulty vestibular system, it's going to make it very, very challenging. And I remember, we just said that about a high percent of our friends with autism have these challenges. Doesn't mean they all have problems with their vestibular system. 
that that could be. So these are some of the things you'll see from everything from excessive movement, from restlessness and distractibility. These are our kids sometimes that are the risk takers. I'll hear, jumped off the top of the roof of the house for that matter and just was fine, just, just loved it. He had a great time. They don't think about any danger. They're thrill seekers for the kids who can't get enough in their system. And the opposite side is going to be that under-responsive vestibular kid who can barely make it off the step of the school bus because it just seems, whoa, way too much movement for his sense of sensory system to tolerate. So you'll see kids who can't get enough swinging are on the other side, they're fearful of the physical activity. So again, sensory is really a complicated area. And then you look at, even in the world of autism, how many pieces of autism that we have. And so you have to really play detective. Um, there's no blood test for it. So you have to be careful before you put in strategies that are great for one kiddo, but maybe not what the other child needed. Okay. Um, so when I think about how can I help with strategies, if I want to calm a student down, I'm going to use slow movement. Calming, rocking, swinging, very linear, very controlled, not a lot of excitement going on. That's obviously my calmer. Why do we have a rocking chair for a newborn baby to calm down with? I want the st movement structured. I'll hear, well, they went out at recess, but they came back in and they were just as erratic as they were when they left. So why were they so erratic? Well, it's probably because I wanted their heart rate to get up. I wanted good movement, but that movement was just regulating to that child that now needed that big heavy muscle activity and job to be given as they came back into the school system. And so for some kids, they went out and ran around and just fine. They didn't have any sensory needs. Our other children need structured movement, not chaotic movement. And then trying to look at what is alerting for our kiddos who are those under-responsive kids. That vestibular system can be woke up. It's alerting. Let's go fast. Let's do some spinning. Let's get that, some jumping going. I'm going to really activate. Remember, vestibular is activated with movement and stopping and starting. So I want to look at what did my kids need and how can I best get it to them. So when I look at structured movie, movement, things like walking, running, swinging, biking, jumping, spinning, dancing, all these things I can make in a structured format. So it's not chaotic. Um, it's, it's, it has some patterns to it. And the child feels more in control when they're done with the movement. So these are just some ideas. You have them on your sheets. But I love all of these things. And it depends on where I'm at. You know, I'm going to go back to universal design and say, first, I'm going to turn on the best video, if that's appropriate for my kiddos. Um, we're going to do one in a little while um, that I love. It's called Move to Learn. Has anybody done Move to Learn? Great. I'm glad to see some hands. And we did it. Sorry for you guys who've been here before. It's just a, we love this site. It's what we, we my go-to. I love Go Noodle. Um, Go Noodle is awesome. And what I will warn you with is Go Noodle has so many cool things on you can just go, oh, this is fun, this is fun. But then our kids with sensory needs are going to be frequently not doing anything because the choreography is so fast. And sometimes they get them all revved up, but they don't bring them back down for you. And so then you've got a teacher going, whoa, that was not the right one we needed to do. So we have to be careful of that. I also have a theory for some of my kids, particularly on the spectrum, who um, don't do anything when there is an exercise or a dance video or something that's on the screen. Because they don't do anything because what do you do when we, we see a video on the screen? We watch a video. We watch the video. And I think a lot of our kids stand there and they watch the video. And that's what they do. So we worked on, you know, if you can't do the choreography, just march. Clap your hands. You can spin around. Um, and we had to chunk it and look at what, chunk it down a little bit for them that if it was too long. And we had to also look at where is it, it for him as far as a personal interest. And maybe we could have him pick out which ones he wants to do. So any of these are going to give you lots of good vestibular input to their brain and to their body and their nervous system. So remember, we're going to talk, start with structured movement. And I don't mean to say in a classroom that you always have to turn on a video. There are kids love, if you just, that you get up and do some, some jumps, some wall push-ups, some chair push-ups, some, uh, let's, you know, academic integrated movement into your academics. PE Central is a great site that has all kinds of structured academic activities that lend themselves with movement. So I can have, a, you know, all the kids on a health activity of everybody stand up and jog in place. And if this is healthy for your heart, keep jogging. You know, eating pizza. No, it's not. They're sitting down. Uh, going for a good walk, standing up, they're jogging again. So I've got movement continuously throughout my day. A lot of times I will hear teachers say, well, we change stations. We're, we're up and we're moving a lot. That is not the same. I think it's great. 
that that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about getting their heart rate up. Um, and so looking at, I love this as an occupational therapist because it is an evidence-based practice for autism, for exercise. And it is everything the OTs were already saying, whether you want to say sensory processing needs or just the word exercise, that what they found that during these six studies, they had a warm up, a cool down, it was 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the afternoon, and every hour they did one minute of like yoga and deep breathing. Um, the activities were involving, um, oh, they did scooter boards, they did uh, jumping, they did weighted exercises, they had um, mini tramps. Uh, they did some, I think, running in place. So it was all the things that we were advocating and then every hour yoga, deep breathing, or run in place. And so what they found out was that every challenging behavior was going down and an increase of positive behavior as well as their physical fitness and improved motor skills. So it was a win-win. Okay. And this is just telling you what more information about the study. If you want to take a look, um, yeah, with scooter boards, jumping on the trampoline, stretching, arm curls. Coach Dave, if you are really into this, he's a wonderful guy. And he, he works more like in one or two kiddos at a time on the autism spectrum. And he really works with them on exercises and core strengthening and activities. He just, he just seems like the nicest guy. Tune into him. He's got some good ideas. And then um, let me check on that one more thing on that. Uh, the only thing I want to add on that is that my teacher, um, one of, I have one teacher in particular who had a classroom of children on the spectrum, and she always did sensory, and she was great at it, and we had some good things going. When I told her about this research and said, let's do it, can we do it this way, she embraced it, and it was made a huge difference with, her, difference with her kids. And I swear, after 20 minutes of exercise, and they came back, no kiddo needed a fidget. Nobody needed a cushion to sit on. No one needed direction. They were all on task with their Chromebooks with a whole class writing uh, prompt. And they would sit for 30 minutes easily and be on task. It was amazing. So she could see the difference. She could see the difference in the mood for the kids, their self-regulation, their emotions. We had kiddos who have very, very limited language. They were then able to use their strategies and the visuals to get out what they were frustrated about when it was time. Um, so I encourage you to up the, up the exercise. Uh, you'll hear therapists talk about sensory circuits also. And again, that was that alerting, organizing, and calming. And so I'm thinking about activities that involve that. I'm going to wake up that child system like we were talking about with vestibular. I'm going to be doing more organization. I want things that cross the midline of the body. I might have a child toss bean bags back and forth to themselves, so just catching from one hand to the other, or cross with an adult. And you could include an academic if you want. Uh, it might be on a balance beam. So their brain has to think about more than just one thing at a time during the organization part. And then the calming part could be yoga. It can be deep breathing. Um, it can be some mindfulness time. You can do a lot of different things. But the, just activities that you can integrate. And this could be, again, can be done in a classroom. Um, I have to pull, throw in a positioning slide. So many times our kids are just not in good positions for their work. We're not all desk chair learners. Think about your children and then think about how are they positioned? Are their feet touching the floor? I go in and I see little ones. They've got sensory needs but they're all over the place because they have no grounding of where their body is in space. My feet need to be touching the floor if I'm in a desk chair. My desk needs to be about an inch and a half to two inches above a bent elbow, meaning it's just a little bit, just enough for me to be here. And I go in and I see desks here. And now I'm trying to write and read, right? So keep that in mind as well. I may need to provide standing desks area. We just bought chair tape or the bed risers. They work great to raise, raise a desk up to height appropriate. For my little ones, you don't need anything. Just raise the desks up to the highest amount, and they're plenty high enough. So trying to find the workstations that work for our kiddos. It's like when your computer freezes because there are too many tasks open or a task is stuck and your brain hits control, alt, delete automatically. And in my case, this means sudden fatigue, balance problems, speaking problems, and disorientation. And this is what an adult describes sensory overload. So I, every time I've heard a quote from an adult, it just comes back to tell me things that our kids can't always describe to us and they don't have the words sometimes to say. Our next area we're going to talk about is our sense of proprioception. And proprioception is kind of a big word. It is housed along our muscle fibers that connect tendons and muscle to bone. And that just means that think about it between our joints. All of your joints have proprioceptors embedded. 
And when those proprioceptors are fired off, it tells us where our body is in space. It gives us good calming, good orientation um, of where my body is in space, good chemicals fired off. I feel good inside. I feel safe. Uh, it gives us an awareness of where my body is in the sense that, say, I'm trying to catch a fly ball. How high do I know to raise my hand? I know where my arm is in relation to the rest of my body. Um, you know, how, how full is my cup of coffee? I thought it was really full, but I forgot I drank some. Have you ever done that where you start to pick up your cup and, oh, it was almost empty. And I make those slight adjustments proprioceptively to know that I don't need that much force to bring it to my mouth. That's good proprioception. Um, but it also gives my postural stability and allows me to help me to motor plan, to move without thinking about where my, what my body is doing. It's really, really powerful, and it's powerful in helping kids with sensory regulation. And it's fired off um, with push, pull, lift, carry. Again, this is where you'll hear therapists say, heavy work, give them a big muscle job, not something light. I want big muscles working because when I do that, I push, I pull, I lift, I carry, I fire off those receptors. This is just giving you the kiddos who are craving, that are sensory seekers, they may be looking for more rough out play, house play. They seek pressure to their joints. They break toys. They're too rough with things. Everything gets broken every time you hand it to them. They don't mean to. They just don't have a good sense of proprioception. Um, also, they, the kids that are over-responsive, now these kids may not like firm touch. They may not want to be near you as much. It does not feel as good to them to run, to jump, to hide. To, you know, they get more on fight flight. And they, therefore, they may not seek out as much movement-based activity. So trying to figure out why are you not joining everything at recess? It can be for so many sensory issues. We have to really dig deeper and ask them. Again, they can tell you. So if I'm an under-responsive proprioceptive kid, it's kind of like getting a shot of Novocaine. I, things just don't feel very good to me. Um, poor motor planning, poor recall of uh, motor sequences. They're clumsy. They're accident prone. These are the kids that are the out-of-sync child. Uh, Carol Kranowitz wrote a great book called The Out-of-Sync Child. And The Out-of-Sync Child Has Fun or something like that was her second one, I believe. But great stories about how these kiddos are just a few beats behind. It takes more for them to be coordinated, to motor plan, to think through things. Okay. And then how do we help the kids? Like we were saying, big muscle activity. Big, hard, heavy work. So I'm going to give that student the job of carrying the water jugs down to the other teacher's classroom. He doesn't know why she needs them, but she needs her water jugs. Another job is going to the library with a stack of books. If I'm going to the computer lab, perhaps they take the computer big thing of paper on a tray. I'm going to the art room. We're going to take Mrs. McKinney, her stack of art paper. Whatever it is that I can make more purposeful, that they have a job to do. And I may invent a job right before academics. They've got to reach way up and write, uh, wipe off the dry erase board, stretch and push. And they're wiping and using their muscles as they do that. So think about things that are purposeful in your classroom. We had students who went down during kindergarten specials while the kids were out, and they wiped all the tables and the chairs and cleaned them really good. That was their job. They came back. They were more ready for class. Um, so there's lots of ways to get it. But big muscle, remember that plate I said, the meals. Big muscle activity is that big meal. And that will stay in my nervous system for about an hour and a half to two hours if I've given it right. That's why I want. I'm going to get more big bang for my buck. And so as you go along and you, and you leave here and you think about, oh, I've got a kid who's chewing, or I've got a kid who seems kind of sensitive to light, I'm going to help with that area, that specific sensory, but I'm going to get more bang for my buck if I first fill my kiddo with good structured movement, big muscle activity, and deep pressure touch when they need it. That's going to fill that kiddo, and then I may see a decrease of some of the other problems. And I may still see, need another, a chewy or some sunglasses outside. But I don't want to just treat the one little area. It's, it's, it's not helping the whole kiddo. Does that make sense? Okay. So these, are, uh, these aren't my kids, but we've had classrooms out waiting to go to the bathroom. You know, that's just such a disruptive time. Anyway, why can't everybody do wall push-ups, right? Um, wiping off chairs in the cafeteria, pushing the trash containers, working on blackboards, cleaning. All kinds of universal design of just big muscles working. Everybody put their pencils down and do 10 seat push-ups. I can't do one anymore, but for them to get their bottoms and their legs off the ground and off the seat, that is working my whole upper body. It is firing off those receptors for proprioception. And then I've got good strengthening and input to my upper body to get ready for riding. So it's a real win-win. Okay. And then under visual processing, 
We're going to switch gears now. And I think we need to do a movement break real quick. Sure. How, how close are we to our we'll just 155? Do. Do okay, we're, 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 whoops, I just caught myself. I knew I would do that. Um, we're going Time to do, one over, do you know? we're just going to stand. And since we're doing our move to the, we're going to stand and we're going to do 10 of our Hindu squats. Okay. So a Hindu squat looks like this. Put your arms out. You guys are, I can see you going downhill. I know I'm an exciting speaker, but you're getting tired. Okay, arms are out. And when I pull my arms back, I say, boo. And then I do a squat. Okay, so it's, you ready? So I'm going to go one, two, three, boo. Squat. Boo. Two. Boo. Three. I should hear you. Boo. Four. Boo. Five. Boo. Six. Boo. Seven. Boo. Eight. Boo. Nine. Boo. Ten. You need a visual closure, right? Okay, have a seat. We have 20 minutes. Left? Yeah. Ah, we have 20 minutes left. But, but where'd I put the thing? Okay. We're going to move along. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yep. So we're going to talk next about visual processing. I just want you to realize under this that visual processing is not just what I, acuity, my visual acuity. It is processing visual information, the detail, the light, the dark, visual perception, figure ground, memory, spatial discrimination, my ocular motor, saccades and pursuits of my eyes, of tracking for reading, visual motor areas. It involves lots and lots of things. And so when I look at someone who's over responsive, again, very fine detail oriented, sensitive to bright lights, colors, attention to detail. Sometimes our kiddos just see the tiny branch on the tree instead of the big picture. It's good to see the tiny branch. I need to do that more, um, but they really see it. Difficulty reading nonverbal cues and difficulty visually viewing the big picture of things. It's really hard if you kind of look at the world through a pinhole to see what's really happening. And so when I'm under responsive, these kiddos may not be able to find what they're searching for when they looked in their desk. If they didn't get enough processing of visual information, they may not notice or respond to visual cues that you're giving them. They're not taking that all in. And they may have difficulty organizing what's happening and recognizing the sounds and sounds that should be familiar to them. Okay. Okay. Kathleen, you go ahead. Oh, go you're, ahead. you're almost there. Yeah. Go ahead. All right. All right, some of our kids will crave visual input. So let me just come around here. They're drawn to light and visual movement. I'm going to tell a story in just a little bit, but I'll wait until I get into the auditory because it, it contains some of this too. Um, some of our kids who have visual processing chill issues go into overload. What does it look like in a classroom? What are you going to see as a teacher? Our students who have visual processing challenges, lots of times they'll skip lines or leave empty spaces on their worksheets. Any kids coming to your mind as you think of that? They may have a visual processing challenge. Students who have visual processing issues might confuse similar letters, like they might see a D as a B, or they might see a, a three and a five, or a shape, a circle and an oval. That's not the only thing that can, can contribute to those confusions. But it definitely can continue. It's something to keep in your mind. They may ski, skip re lines when they're reading aloud with the class. Um, they may have trouble remembering what they just read because they're not reading efficiently, because their eye isn't processing and tracking efficiently. These are all clues that you may have a student with visual processing challenges. He might write over his own writing and not even realize that his letters are over his own writing. Um, he may have trouble filling in the blanks on a page. He may write where the words are and not actually where the blank is. He may leave out words and sentences when he writes. <coughs> These are all clues that you might have a student who has visual processing ch challenges. So what do I do about it? I mean, it's nice to know that he might have that, but what do I do about it? Here are some things that you as a teacher can do to set that child up for success. Um, reduce the amount of fluorescent lighting in your classroom if your building administration will allow you to do that. There's a lot of research on fluorescent lighting being difficult, difficult for a lot of students to process through and see their words efficiently. What I just said was poorly worded, but you get my point there. Check and see if you can use natural lighting or incandescent lighting, lamps. Not all schools will allow that. 
There are filters that you can buy to put over the fluorescent lighting. Again, don't go out and buy it on your own without permission because some districts won't allow it, but some will. My district did and it made a huge difference in one of my classrooms where they put the blue-gray filters over the lights. I couldn't believe the difference it made. Um, try less words and bigger print on worksheets. This can be like a miracle. If you take a test and turn one page of test into two pages with bigger words and less pictures, for kids with visual processing challenges, it can be a miracle. You'll be really surprised. It's definitely worth a try. Um, watch for bleed through on books, especially paperbacks. What I'm talking about is you know how on a page, especially in a paperback where you can see the print from the back side, kids who have visual processing challenges, that's almost like two layers of print on the same page. And it's hard for them to decode because it's hard for them to discriminate between the back side of the paper and the front side of the paper. If you think that might be a, ch a, pro a problem for a child, you can easily <coughs> test it out. Just go to the copy machine and copy two pages, you know, without it being back to back, and see if it makes a difference on that child's comprehension and his ability to read. Uh, it really can be a miracle. Okay, more classroom strategies for visual processing. Try highlighting where the answer lines are. Take his answer sheet and just highlight the blanks. For some kids, it will make a huge difference. Highlight the important text. Sometimes it's the directions on a test. If you have a child and you've seen on this couple of slides, huh, maybe he does have visual processing challenges. <coughs> Give it a try. Try highlighting the directions and see if he does a better job. There are other things you can try, color overlays. I'm not going to go into detail on that, but there are other things that you might try to see if you can address the needs of these kids in the classroom. For some kids, it'll help if you put a starting point on a page and maybe a red dot on that side of the page. For some kids, that will help them know where their parameters are on a piece of paper. And for other kids, it, ha it helps if you just highlight where they're right, supposed, supposed to write. You're not going to do that forever, but it can help train the brain <coughs> to know where to put their answers. All right, there is so much in that area of visual processing, but I'm going to skip into auditory, because auditory, touch may be the first one to develop, but auditory is the hardest one to control, because there are sounds everywhere. There are sounds in the hallway. This fan is making a really big sound. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there are sounds everywhere, and most of them we can't do anything about. I had a, a little boy uh, with autism who was hypersensitive to the sounds that fluorescent lights give right before they burn out. Okay, we know they give that kind of buzz. I mean, I think I can hear that right now. But before they burn out, he would come up to me and say, Mrs. Oler, Mrs. Oler, light scream at me, light scream at me. And the next day, the light would be burned out. <coughs> Who knew? Okay, this boy had huge behavior issues. So he, of course, had a behavior plan, and we wrote the school custodian, into, with his permission, into this kid's behavior plan. And every day, Billy went on a walk through the building with Mr. Rick. Okay? This is an absolutely true story. Okay, this boy needed movement in his day, too, so it hit a whole lot of, whole lot of areas. But he'd walk the hallways of the whole building with Mr. Rick and point out which lights were going to burn out in the next couple of days. It, it really worked. It really did. There's more to that story, which is pretty darn funny. You can come up afterwards, and I'll tell you the rest of it. But anyway, that just points out when a light was getting ready to burn out, this boy was having none of it. His fight and flight uh, impulses were on high alert. There was no learning going on, and his behavior was something to behold. And it was because the lights were burning out. Go figure. It's the hypersensitivity, over-responsiveness to auditory stimuli. Well, in auditory, you've got auditory processing. We know that as teachers. Uh, your SLPs can help you a lot with this. If you have a student in your class who consistently has trouble following directions, especially oral directions, put on your radar, maybe this student has auditory processing challenges. Work with your SLP because that's often overlaid with language. Not always, 
but often. That's a, that's a person in your building that can help you with that. Student who has consistent trouble following the oral directions. Poor memory and sequencing skills. Trouble paying attention. These are some clues that your student may have trouble with auditory processing. All right, what about the kids who are over responsive to auditory stimuli? These are your kids who are always in trouble in the loud areas in the school. The hallways, the atrium, if you have one of those echoey atriums where the kids come in, the cafeteria. We tend to treat the behavior and not think, oh, wait a minute, maybe it's, maybe it's their input system. You can address that in ways, simple ways, like putting a set of headphones on the kids when they're in those, in those noisy areas. Or I'm going to do secondary in just a minute. The best way we address that in the high school is change passing periods for kids. So they're not doing passing periods when it's, what, 100 decibels in a high school hallway when kids are slamming dot locker doors? Holy moly. OK, <laughs> but anyway. Also, agitation or withdrawal from people who talk loud or fast or constantly. <laughs> Be aware when you're creating groups, learning groups. If you have that child who does that stuff, that may not be the place to put your student that you think is over-responsive to auditory stimuli. And then under-responsive. These kids are the ones that are always the last one to hear their name called. You know that kid in your class, right? That kid may be under-responsive to auditory stimuli. They often appear tuned out. Often appear tuned out. And they may be tuned out. That may be legitimate. But they may be under-responsive to your voice. Auditory discrimination. These are your students when they're learning their phonetic system, when they're learning to write, read, have a hard time hearing the difference between cap and cat. I'm going to say it again, cap, cat. Those are pretty minimal differences. OK, top, tap. A student with auditory discrimination issues is going to struggle with that. And it's going to affect their ability to learn to read. If you have a student who's, who continually shows that kind of problems, you may want to switch to a sight word literacy program for that child, or a whole language literacy program, and not focus entirely on a phonics-based literacy program. Uh, it, you just may have to differentiate the way you teach that. And then the kids who crave auditory stimuli, they, say that they, they may say that they have to have the TV on to do their homework. It's possible that that's true. I mean, I'm a mother. I don't like to think that that's, you know, I don't buy into that when my kids tell me that. But there are some kids that actually produce better when there's competing stimuli, their auditory craving. So what do I do? Biggest thing, use more visuals. Write the list of instructions down rather than just telling them. Try to use visuals to illustrate what you're trying to do. Instead of doing what I'm doing and talking a ton, rely more on your visual right there. And your kids with auditory processing challenges are going to do better. Try to use a quiet voice and don't yell. We're teachers. We've got a lot of competing stimuli when we've got a class full of kids. If you can find another system to get kids' attention rather than raising your voice, you'll do better. Limit the background noise as much as possible. When another class is passing in the hallway, shut the door. Try not to put the kid that you think might be hypersensitive to sound next to the furnace blower, next to the blower where the heat comes out. It's probably a bad place for that kid. All right. Okay. Just going to um, go quickly a little bit. We've got about 10 minutes left. Um, just trying to uh, continue with what Kathy was sharing. You know, all of our art class has tennis balls on the bottom of chairs. It just helps everybody to reduce the sound, the noises. And then looking at some of those visual supports that so many times our kids are missing out on those cues. They didn't miss, they missed the directions. Their receptive language skills on top of auditory problems were really missing the boat. So we know we need the support of visuals to shut down those tasks 
and to show them the directions. I have a lot of kids. I've bought in so many headphone sets, I can't tell you. And there's some kind of cool ones that look kind of like a, a rubbery headband, but on the end are earbuds. Kids will hold them, let them rest around their neck, and they just put them on. Those work for some of the kids. Other kids like the big heavy headphones because they give deep pressure touch in addition to reducing that auditory sensitivity. And we had a, several students, or teachers rather, that had started to wear microphones because they had a bad cold and the kids couldn't hear them very well and they were a little raspy. Um, they found that more kids were paying attention when they used the microphone, so they were able to filter out that background sound, tune into the teacher's voice. So it was a universal design strategy, actually, which was really nice. <coughs> um, and then also, I think we've got most of these here. We'll go ahead and I think just realizing that our kids need extra supports and personal cues, and not to just assume that it was non-compliance. Um, and I just want to re remind you, thinking of a lot of times we'll think it in the auditory world for some reason of our kids yelling or they talk so loud and they just talk louder and louder and louder and they don't have good regulation of their voice. They don't, aren't able to modulate their voice to meet the, the situation. We've all done it at times when you're really excited about something. You might be talking too loud, not realizing it's not an area where you really wanted to share with everybody. And that some of our kids live their life that way. But to be aware of, I can give someone like a visual cue of a, a volume control guide and this is an indoor voice and this is an outdoor voice and all those great strategies. But go back to that structured movement, big heavy muscle activity and deep pressure touch. So if I fill that child with good sensory information and input to his body, his chances of being able to decrease his voice and then use the visual cue are going to be more successful. Okay? Um, and before we run out of time, I wanted to make sure we got to interoception. And that is all of our internal organs. That's our heart breathing lungs, hunger, thirst, bowel, bladder, sexual areas, emotions, all that internal sensory areas. And what happens is we get lots of faulty messages. Why is it the child that is like seven or eight years old and still isn't potty trained and yet she seems to be doing so well in other areas? It may be that she's not getting that sensory information that her bladder has filled up and I need to go to the bathroom until it's too late. Um, a lot of times it's the kiddo who is constantly asking to be able to go to the nurse's office. Maybe they really do need to. Maybe it's a work avoidance. But perhaps there's a need that something is hurting, something is out of sync, and they need some help with it. Um, causing stress, anxiety, a decrease for attention if I'm having these problems. If I'm an over-responser, I've got to go to the bathroom a lot. I may feel hungry a lot. I've, little aches and pains may feel monumental. I need frequent trips. So I may have the tiniest bit of urine, but it feels like my bladder is full. I just got finished eating, but you know I need a little bit more. Um, so lots of stress that comes with these areas. <coughs> and I thought I had another slide on there. I just want you to be able to realize that I'm going to have under-responsive, I'm going to have over-responsive. But in this area, I can have kiddos who think that they want, they're hungry, they need a snack. But that discriminative piece, I, I'm getting a, a, an issue, I'm getting a feeling inside, I think I'm hungry. But I gave him a snack and he sat there and he ate one bite and he left it. The message wasn't clear. He was having some gastrointestinal problems. Maybe it was a stomach ache, but it didn't feel like a stomach ache. So that can be a problem. Um, so I'm getting mixed messages. I don't understand why my heart is racing really fast and I'm breathing sh more shallowly. I'm having stress and I'm having anxiety, but I'm not making the connection. And so it's teaching our kids to be more in tune, to do mindfulness activities, to stop, to lay down on the floor if that allows you that, or to be able to just sit and put your head down and listen to your breathing, listen to your heart rate, okay? So just very important. And just want you guys to be aware of sleep supports for our kids. Kid, whether sensory or not, sensory challenging kids, many of these kids sleep very, very poorly at night and they're up during the night. So what we can do, so these are a nice list of things that are very holistic, that can be very, very helpful. And I've got lots of parents, parents who are seeking this kind of information. So please share if you're in an ACR meeting as well. Okay. Just some more information on that. The one thing I want to say on the intro reception is that when I have that stress and that anxiety for all of these issues and all these sensory areas, the area of the brain that is kind of that relay station that lets higher learning and memory happen doesn't like stress and anxiety and it shuts down that amygdala. And so we've got to be able to help our kids with those sensory issues if we ever want learning to happen. All right? Remember the top of the pyramid? Okay. And I think we're going to be about out of, I think we're, 
The other areas are, you, you can see on your handout sheet, again, we do a whole, whole day workshop, so an hour and 15, we got through quite a bit pretty quick. Uh, you guys were awesome. Thank you so much for your attention and coming today.